afternoon. Let's start the second session of our conference with the round table is to meet you in training, preparing young people for uh, We have three very distinguished speakers. I'll introduce you in a strict alphabetical order. Uh, Professor Philippe Bourdain is current director of the Catholic Institute of Paris. He holds a doctorate in theology from UCP and a doctorate uh, from Sorbonne in history of religion and religious anthropology. His field of research are moral theology, theological hermeneutics, uh, and the Second Vatican Council. He has published extensively. by popular vote as a deputy to the Legislative Assembly, where he served as president to several central legislative commissions. Thank you for being with us. And then Dr. Agostino Santoni, who is currently the CEO of Cisco Italy. He was previously at SAP where he was a managing director for Italy with full operational responsibilities. He is a member of the General Council of Asolombarda and of the Board of Directors of Confindustria Digitale and of the Executive Committee and the General Council of Fondazione Fiera Milano. Thank you for being with us. I, of course, will be very brief because we are late. According to a recent uh, UNESCO publication, in line with a similar definition of the European Science Foundation, knowledge may be understood as the way in which individuals and societies apply meaning to experience. It can therefore be seen broadly as the information, understanding, skills, values, and attitude acquired through learning. As such, Knowledge is linked inextricably to the cultural, social, environmental, and institutional context in which it is created and reproduced. Creativity, entrepreneurship, learning to learn, digital competence, and other 21st century skills and competences are emerging as more and more important for innovation, growth, and participation in a digital society and economy. The key challenge for research and policy is, of course, to make sure that supply and demand for new skills and competences are matched. But the real question is, how can or should this knowledge and these skills and competences be thought, acquired, and recognized? And this is the first question for our uh, guests, I would ask them to uh, approach the question, to answer the question from their specific cultural, professional, and geographical perspective. So first, uh, in alphabetical order, Rector Bourdain, please take the floor. Thank you very much. So I will, I will answer this question starting from the title of uh, this uh, conference, preparing young people for work. What I would say is that I believe that today, young people want to be protagonists of the preparation, of their own preparation. Uh, let me mention this wonderful uh, text from St. Paul VI in the Basilica of Nazareth, 
6th of January 1964. He says, O silence of Nazareth teaches recollection, reflection, and eagerness to heed the good inspirations and words of true teachers. Teaches the need and value of preparation, of study, of meditation, of interior life, of secret prayer seen by God alone. What I believe uh, is, is that today it doesn't work. Your question, uh, Professor Maseguera, was uh, how, how does it work hmm? to, to take into account the new needs of what was uh, presented uh, in the afternoon as the, the, the new era of the digitalization. More than ever, uh, young people are protagonists of their own preparation, and they want, they demand to be protagonists. So what, what I believe is more important in, in terms of recognition, or in terms of mutual recognition, is for us teachers, for us universities, uh, to acknowledge their taking part into their own preparation, of course in courses, in uh, discussions uh, uh, that are really more and more part of teaching, but also in uh, all the engagement uh, activities they are taking part of and that uh, prepare for them, uh, to, prepare them to acquire soft skills like associations. If I take the example of my own university, when I became the rector in 2011, uh, there was only one student association. Today there are 30, uh, you know, in uh, 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 humanitarian associations, sports, arts, uh, eloquence. Eloquence, we developed during the session the need for rational thinking, but, uh, you know, they are keen on uh, debating, debating, and this is a soft skill we really need. So I would say, uh, let us recognize in what, uh, uh, in what measure they, they are real protagonists of their own preparation for uh, taking part in companies and in the needs of the economic world. Thank you. Rector Campos. Bene, grazie tante. Io prendo un minuto almeno per ringraziare la Fondazione, grazie tante Presidente, Segretario Generale, Rettore per l'invito e, e per il vostro interesse in avere la, la prospettiva dell'America Latina, veramente. Grazie tante per quello. Io sono onorato e ancora sofferente del jet lag, però pronto per parlare. Adesso cambio le lingue perché mi hanno detto che devo parlare in inglese. Quindi, eh. um, I believe we have five minutes, right? Yes. Okay, let me see how I do this. Um, the bishops in Aparecida, they say that we live in a change of era now, especially in cultural terms. Um, following this idea at the International Federation of, of Catholic Universities, IFCU, we presented a report. I'm not going to go through the whole report because it was interesting, but it's too long. It was called Changes of Higher Catholic Education or Challenges of Higher Catholic Education and Work by Corinne Melul, French, by the way, and very good. And uh, she, she presented three main conclusions that had to do with your question. First one, 50% of daily activities, not 50% of the jobs, 50% of daily labor activities that take place in our, in our labor place are going to be uh, undertaken soon by machines or algorithms. So we have 50% of the time left to do something else. Train better, think more, or whatever. Two, soft, integral, global skills, however you want to call them, will be much valued by future employees. And in our case in Costa Rica, it was very interesting knowing that the employers of our students say that the diploma is good for being hired and for your first promotion. But after that, soft skills are the ones that, that say whether you're gonna be promoted or not. And what, one thing they mentioned was, yes, leadership is very important, yes, solidarity, working in a group is very important, but there's one thing that we are really missing, and, and that is, as the psychologist said, resilience, the ability to 
go ahead to undertake difficulty with patience and hope. By the way, uh, San Ignatius talks a lot about this, about resiliency. And the third one was rapid changes generate a process where knowledge is constantly being questioned and eventually turns obsolete. This is happening very, very fast. So she was saying, instead of undergoing a dimensional process of constantly updating curricula, the best thing to do is to teach our students to learn and to learn fast. And for that, there's one thing they need, apart from, from the other ones. And it's also a virtue, and that's humbleness. Because you need to be ready to be constantly learning. And once you get a PhD, that's not that easy, right? So humbleness is very important. She concluded that in order to keep on being relevant, and that's the word she used, Catholic universities need to further develop something we should have been doing for decades. And that's a pedagogical method based on values or and virtues. Uh, then she carries on, but I don't know how, how much time I still have. No? One minute, two minutes? Okay. Okay, great. And then she said, well, we find in Pope Francis' teachings a way to undertake this, this pedagogical method based on, on values and virtues when he develops a useful idea of how to center the pedagogical method on the, hum on the human being, on la persona humana. And he talks about three pillars. The first one, sense of transcendency, as we already talked about. Education understood in relation with God and with the others. Education as a vocation, as his has already, already said. Educating, education based on three languages that have been explained Thoroughly, mind, high quality re uh, reasoning, hands, sense of pragmatism, use education to change things for good, and heart, passion, and sense of transcendency. Risks in the learning process. Uh, so, if very, very fast, putting all this together, should, we should be able to, to do what you were asking in your question. Thank you. Thank you, both of you, for being, being very fast. So after the, the academic perspective, even if from two different areas, geographical areas, the perspective of uh, the entrepreneurs. Uh, Dr. Santoni. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor. And greetings from uh, Mr. Carlo Bonomi, president uh, of uh, our region, Lombardy region the, for the enterprises. So if I have to tweet, my five minutes, I would say, it's for the business training and education important? The answer is yes, yes, yes. If what is needed, it needs a great cooperation among everyone, requires the ability to act now, and requires to execute in a humble way, and there is a strong view to us, to our ego, to take a day off. The organization, companies, city, regions, countries that have the, the capability to do this will be the winner or the countries that will succeed in, uh, in the world we see. Just a couple of reflections on why it's needed. Our industry, I'm, I'm working in the technological industry, and we gave a name to the economy we are living, the data economy, the artificial intelligence economy, but I really like the concept of software economy, because everything is now software. This is the reason why in your smartphone you have more than 40 or 50 applications, and the reason is to develop applications now to develop software, if you compare five years ago, the saving of timing has been reduced by 80%. So everything becomes software. And if you reflect for a second, your smartphone, and I'm sure you are familiar with this, if you want to upgrade a smartphone operating system, when you go to bed, you connect your smartphone to the power cord, you wake up in the morning, and your operating system of your smartphone is updated 
with new capabilities, right? So we are, we are joking on this concept on say, how can we make sure as an industry that we upgrade our operating system as a smartphone? We connect ourselves to the battery and we upgrade our operating system, which is the message here. The message here is the speed of innovation, it's unprecedented. We have to make sure that the partnership and the capability has to be best ever, best, best ever, and requires great capability from, from our side, from the business side, and from the um, education side. I will give you a small example of my meeting of yesterday. The topic was the, with the Ministry of Innovation around uh, autonomous driving and other hype in the industry. At the table, there was an insurance company, two technological company, the Ministry of Innovation and the university. I've never thought five years ago to have such a meeting for such contest. What we are looking for in terms of education, we are looking for young people that has to be innovative, responsible, and aware. When we are interviewing people, we are looking for empathy, empathy. we are looking for adaptability, and we are looking for trust. And trust means students and new workers that trust in others and trust in the future. It's time to act now. Thank you. I think our guests have been extremely effective because in 10 minutes we had a full round. Uh, so we learned that our young students are, should be protagonist, resilient and innovative. The second question which naturally arises from, from uh, the reading of the Laudato Si, which is the path that uh, as a foundation we are following uh, since uh, a couple of years uh, with conference, uh, workshop. The, the question is, is it possible to provide the young generation with an education to the integral ecology that is uh, an, uh, an education sensitive to the various aspects of both human ecology and environmental ecology? Is it possible to educate to the protection of human and social life against environmental degradation? Should the issue of ecology be added or extended to educational programs, including issues related to the global warming process, the development of ecological energy innovation based on renewable energy source, recycling, the need to reduce the use of plastic, etc. Is it possible to educate young generation to the integral ecology? Rector Bourdain. Yes, I believe it is possible and I will continue the same input. It is all the more possible uh, that uh, they are aware you, you need, for, you, you need uh, young people who are aware. I mean, in that uh, domain of sustainable uh, responsibility, young people are aware. They know that they are part of the problem uh, for our planet, but not only our planet, for integral ecology. They know that they are uh, part of the difficulty of changing the way of life. But they are committed, not all of them, but many of them are very committed in changing their way of life. We all know young people, and we have them in the universities, who ask for concrete changes that will effectively change their life and the collective life. So, as I mentioned, the fact that they, they choose a university today for the excellence of a curriculum, but also for the amount of uh, uh, association, associative uh, activities that are launched by students, but it's the same for companies. They choose a company that will show concrete commitment 
into uh, integral ecology. And that is really a uh, uh, um, uh, sign. So you said, how, how, how are we going to, uh, to, be, uh, to answer to the, this problem? I would say uh, we have to listen to their longing for new leverage to counter the dangers of Anthropocene. Um, they want uh, concrete commitment and concrete choices because they are more and more convinced that everything is connected, as Laudato Si says. They see their work in the future as connected with the course of sustainable development. Young people have direct access to scientific data about climate and environmental change. They see the effects of those changes in their lives, on fragile communities. They want to be part of the solution and they increasingly refuse to contribute, worsening the situation. Uh, I'm a, a professor of ethics. Uh, I've seen things change, change, changing in, in, in last years when um, a person responsible in a company for ethical questions comes uh, he can develop or she can develop uh, a, a wonderful talk, but students at once will check and get information to contradict the rational, the ethical rational that is put in front of them. So as we teachers are confronted to uh, the contest by the students on what we are teaching, companies are to be contested on their real commitment in uh, sustainable development. So it is, a, it is a common challenge. Thank you. Um, I'll, ask with, I'll answer with an example, with an anecdote, I should say. In 2017, we organized the Ratzinger Foundation International Symposium in Costa Rica. And the title was Laudato Si, A Necessary Conversion to Human Ecology. And it was a big, big event, first time in that, in that part of the world. Uh, we ended up with a big index, a Laudato Si Index, where 107, 127 countries were evaluated on whether they were doing things close in terms of public policy, how far or how near they were to what the Pope is saying should be done in Laudato Si. And we have this index. Actually, now the, the this year's uh, last year's uh, new index is, is already being published, uh, and that we can evaluate how more or less 93 percent of the population is doing in terms of Laudato Si. One very interesting conclusion is that according to our index, 55 percent of the population lives in conditions that can be considered unacceptable according to Laudato Si. We were doing all this. And at the same time, as you were saying, we were having all our students back in our campus asking, all right, you can go around and save the world with that huge index, but what about our campus? Are we having a Laudato Si campus? Are we living Laudato Si here home? Are we, are we actually behaving as the Pope is asking us to behave? How much are we living what the Pope says, um, making hope concrete? Concretizando la esperanza in Spanish is the word he uses. So we are constantly asked by our own students to live whatever we're saying, and especially when it comes to the ecology. Because I do believe that as honesty, responsibility, solidarity for our new generation, ecological responsibility is a value, and it's taken like that. Uh, so, uh, absolutely, if you want to do something with Laudato Si and with ecological development, you need to be coherent. The word here is coherency. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, just a couple of examples. Um, I'm a strong believer that the moments we are living requires a different uh, leadership style. And my view on this is that the, the leadership required the, the capability to combine people at the center of the innovation we are living, business and the social impact. 
and social impact become a, a great tools to create energy in the organization. Two short examples. We are, we are training students and we were used to train students as an industry since a while. And also in the company I am, we were training students at school. Then we decided to give different, I mean, technology will win and the education will win when we will close the gap on inequality. And then we start training people in prisons. So we have presence now in uh, several prisons here in Italy where we give a second chance to people through education. The results, we have, we have now more than 1,000 students in prisons. The results, it's not because of the company, it's because of them. It's incredible. We give a little piece of future to their life. The second project is with Comunità Sant'Egidio. Also homeless are important in the world we are living. And of course, they, don't, they, not, they don't just not need educational training on technology. They need a house first. But when they have a house, and then when you invest time on training them, yesterday, one of, the, one of my colleagues called me say she was happy like crazy. She said there were 35 students and most of them were homeless. I don't know where we'll end with this project. Maybe we will not succeed. But just the beauty to have 35 homeless at Comunità Sant'Egidio seated there, listening the evolution of technology, I believe it's a great example on, on the things, on the concept, it's time to act. And technology has to behave like this, has to consider a platform to drive and to help to reduce the gap on inequality in my country, but in the world. So I'm, I'm, I'm strongly committed that to do that requires a different level or a different kind of a leadership in our economy. A recent study conducted in 15 countries worldwide found that globally young people are more optimistic about the future than older generations. Despite facing much higher unemployment rates, more instability, lower wage than their predecessors, today's youth are entering adult adulthood confident that they can build a better future for themselves and for those that follow. The question is, do you share this optimism? Yeah, obviously there is a contradiction, yes. but I understand their optimism. And first of all, because this generation is longing for connecting with other people. And technology, in a sense, is not sufficient, but also offers an opportunity to connect. Not only to connect on the web, but also to meet concretely, because you can organize. And, and this is a, a reason, uh, certainly, for, for hope for themselves. Um, in fact, uh, this young generation experiences new forms of social life. And in some time, in, in, in partly um, uh, possible because of uh, uh, digital connection, but also relying on alterity and togetherness. Uh, this generation is longing for some experience of connection with very, very different people, the poor, uh, those on the margins, and, uh, those from different countries and, uh, and the different cultures. And the second reason for hope, and for their hope, which I, I agree is sometimes astonishing to see that obviously the situation is, is, is a crisis, but there is hope, there is hope. 
The second reason is that they really train for open discourse and new means for democratic life. I was amazed, maybe you followed that President Macron in France launched a grand debate, grand debate. Uh, in my university, young people organized the grand debate themselves. I once entered, it was on tax reform. I knew very little about these questions. They had convened a professor to be the witness of, what, of their exchange and debate. He did not intervene. Sometimes he would be asked a question, is that correct? But I was amazed of the energy they put into organizing the debate and the, the way they were really successful. Even the, the professor said, well, uh, congratulations. So if, if I finish very quickly, I think there is a longing for intergenerational relations in this, in this generation. They're very open uh, compared to my generation in the 1970s. We were very critical of the older generation. They know today that there are many things they can do we cannot. But they also perceive that there is some kind of human experience that is in the older generation and that they really need. So the challenge uh, is before us. Are we going to respond this openness to intergenerational uh, dialogue? If yes, there will be dialogue and we can construct the society together. If not, they will do by themselves. And for me, it's really as a crossroads. So a any, any way universities or companies can respond to the desire for meaningful transformation is, is in the good direction. But if we refuse to do so, it can be a very severe split and in, in, in a period where uh, populist leaders do as if there was no uh, differences, no pluralism in our societies, if we do not produce positive experiences of pluralism in terms of capacity of discussing, of arguing, then we prepare uh, the spreading of populist uh, governments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, due to time constraints, I'll just said, leave it to whatever the rector Cordain said, I agree with you, so I can put something on, on the table, something else. Yes, young people tend to be more optimistic and probably have a better or deeper developed conscience, especially when it comes to ecological conscience, as I said, taking it as an ecological responsibility, as a value. Um, in this respect, let me just say that, and from more a political science, scientist point of view, it's very interesting the service that Pope Francis has, has done with his language, the way he writes his documents and presents his documents. I, I could even say it that he has somehow democratized Vatican language and, and put it there for everybody to understand. Maybe you don't agree, maybe you do, but you cannot say you cannot understand. Just a quick anecdote. For wise, uh, when I served as ambassador to the Holy See, I remember listening closely to Pope Benedict's homilies. And it took me a couple of days to find and understand everything. I'm not a theologist myself, political scientist. Uh, however, when Pope Francis speaks, you understand right away, you can agree or not, but right away you get the idea very easily. Sometimes he speaks even with, with what uh, methodologists call sound bites that are very catchy, uh, with strong ideas. And I believe that in, in terms of uh, intergeneration, inter, in, inter, yeah, how to say intergenerational uh, relationships, this is fantastic because you can work on this Vatican document 
very deep and doesn't matter age or even the background you come from, you can do that. Um, having said that, um, maybe because of rapid changes during this era, I do believe and I agree with the employers in Costa Rica that one of the, of the abilities, skills that, that maybe the new generation lacks, at least what we've seen, is resilience. Um, getting used to getting things very, very fast. Uh, or the ability to transform the joy and happiness that comes during good times or moments of success to patience when hard times arrive. So I do believe that we have the duty, the responsibility of training educate, or educating a more resilient, optimistic generation with the vocation to work for the common good. And we have to do it as Pope Francis, he says, his, his own says, as a, as a big act of love. That is what education is all about. Thank you. Um, I like very much the statement around trust is the ultimate currency. And if I look at the generation, the Z and the millennials, I believe the difference, if I may, versus my generation is probably the trust. So their capability to trust others. They give me confidence that they will, be, they will create a better world than the ones that I contributed. They are much more aware of the future of our planet. They are, much, they are more generous. And this is the reason why my answer to your question is yes. So thank you, thank you very much to our panelists for this very rich uh, round table and above all for being very short. Okay.